Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Dubcast with Dubside. I'm Andrew Lazaga. Dubside's away this week, so today we have a special guest. I'm very excited to be talking to James Mankey. James is a Canadian sea kayaking coach and Greenland style instructor who's taught at sea kayak symposiums all over the world. He's a member of the Hurricane Riders and participated in the Greenland National Kayaking Championships in 2014, along with fellow Canadian James Roberts. He's featured in a short documentary film about the championships titled Greenland Bound, A Paddler's Pilgrimage, which was directed by James Roberts and David Hartman. James, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks so much, Andrew. It's great to hear you. So, how's the uh, summer uh, sea kayak instructor season looking for you? <laughs> this this summer is looking absolutely packed. I mean, I, I think with last year and uh, the pandemic sort of being right dead in the middle, uh, there was a lot of loss of business, really, when it came to instruction. And this year, we're seeing... Um, a huge spike. So it's actually looking a lot busier this year than it has even in the previous years. So yeah, things are looking good. Things are looking good. Yeah. I've been reading that a lot more people are interested in getting on the water. And um, I was wondering if that applied to the high end type of sea kayaking, you know, that, that uh, involves uh, the serious kind of coaching that you do. Right. Right. And uh, this year, Really what I've done is I've taken a little bit of a step back and I'm starting to focus a lot more on beginners and just getting people on the water. And uh, one of the reasons for that is this summer I had planned to do uh, a roll across Canada tour. And this has been a dream of mine for a number of years. And really that's just traveling from the west of Canada all the way to the east, teaching as many people as I can how to roll a kayak. Hmm. Uh, And the focus on that was to, to have, you know, some higher level sort of the paddlers that are looking to accomplish the really tough roles and all the way to beginner just looking to to roll and that unfortunately has to be postponed again so now we're pushing that to 2022 and so I really had to shift and put focus just on my local market and um, doing that uh, there's a lot of people right now that are just getting out on the water they're realizing you know their health is important. Being outside is a, is a really great way uh, to get out of the house. Um, and so that market has kind of exploded in our area. So putting some focus in that area and it's kind of, re- it, it's, it's nice. I, I really enjoyed it. Like being able to teach new paddlers and, and inform them on some stuff. Really. It's just eye opening and seeing their eyes open. It just, it fills with, fills me with joy to be able to teach people like that. Yeah, that's great. Um, and where are you located? So I'm located uh, right now in Victoria, BC. So uh, okay. uh, a few years ago now, we sort of got rid of the house and we moved into a fifth wheel and, a, and got ourselves a nice truck and uh, with the intent to really live on the road and, and have that life of travel, if you will. And last winter, we were blessed enough to be able to go down to Baja for six months and travel down there. Um, and then... Of course, the pandemic hit, so we had to come back to Canada. And since then, we've been pretty static since uh, since the pandemic. So we're really looking forward to things opening back up so we can start moving around again. I love Vancouver Island. That's just an amazing place to paddle. Uh, so many uh, yeah. great places. A lot of people have been moving there recently. Um, Justine Kurgenvin moved there. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. She's up in Tofino area, or you clue it. So yeah, she's she's now new to the area. A lot of uh, Gordon Brown's another one that recently moved to the island, and he's no about an way. hour away from my place. Yeah, Gordon yeah, Brown so moved there. A, a, yeah, Gordon Brown is now here. Wow. So there are some infamous uh, kayakers kind of coming to this area, and, and I think one of the reasons for that is primarily the diversity that we have in this area. I mean, it's, uh, I would consider probably one of the more diverse paddling areas in the world. I mean, we've got a ton of currents here. We've, we've got just everything. It's just an absolute playground. So if you're a sea kayak instructor or even just an enthusiast, like Vancouver Island is really sort of the mecca, if you will. It's uh, very sought after by a lot of sea kayakers. So it's not a huge surprise that some big names start rolling in after, after the years, you know, so... 
yeah, it's great to have those. It's great to have some really great, uh, excellent paddlers here on the island. Wow, that's unbelievable that the that the Brits would be moving there too. That's amazing. <laughs> um, but you know, yeah, Gordon Brown. He's an excellent guy. I really like him. I enjoy his company for sure. Yeah, I was lucky enough to take a class with him down at the Golden Gate Sea Kayak Symposium a few years back. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I really miss uh, going up there. Um, I usually go up to uh, Vancouver Island uh, during the summer. We spent the summer around the San Juans, and it was so crowded. There were just so many boaters and a lot of kayakers out there. Definitely a lot of people are trying to get outside and get out on the water. Yeah, and, and I just feel with more people getting on the water, and especially new people getting on the water, uh, you know, as instructors, it's kind of our responsibility to help educate some of those people. So that's why I'm putting more focus into into beginners and people that mm. are just starting to learn because there's just so much there's so much to learn when you first get on the water, and and I I think especially around these this area uh, with the current, the water temperature. The way things can just turn very quickly, wind opposing current, um, it can also be very dangerous. So, uh, I mean, it looks very uh, inviting and a lot of people will go out, you know, and and purchase themselves with say, like a Pelican kayak with no bulkheads and just sort of start migrating out into the ocean. But the reality is, is things can turn quickly. And if you end up swimming, uh, in a lot of cases, we see fatalities. So, Hmm. uh, that that alone, it's it's just it's a really good idea to put focus on beginners, and especially as we're seeing that grow right now, just to help educate them about our area, especially mm-hmm. it's because it can be dangerous. It can be fun, but it can also be very dangerous if things turn around. Yeah, just curious. Do you know um, of any bad accidents recently? Not recently. I mean, I, I think last season uh, we had a couple deaths. Uh, out in the Souk area. So there was, I think the last one I remember was there was a fellow that was paddling from Souk headed out toward Port Renfrew and he just wasn't found. But that particular day, I remember going out to Jordan River to go surfing and the winds had kicked up so high that, that I just, I postponed the day. I said, okay, we're not, we're not going out today. It's the winds are kicking up too much and it looked like a really nasty storm coming through. So that guy was actually spotted paddling that day, and unfortunately, he never, he never did make it back. They never did recover his body. They did find his kayak, but unfortunately, he uh, was never found. Oh, so wow. that's gen- that's generally the case that we find is you know the craft will be found, but the the body generally isn't unless they've got a life jacket on. Um, you know, then then the body can be recovered. But wearing a, wearing a dry suit around here is is essential. It's something that's really uh, something to consider, I think, if you plan on being uh, out out on the water, especially the ocean. The lakes, obviously, that's not as big of a deal. But when hypothermia can kick in within 20 minutes, that's not a lot of time swimming, mm-hmm. um, you know, trying to get back into your kayak. So, yeah, yeah. I, again, I, ju- I just feel educating people is the right thing to do. And by doing that, we should see far less people uh, getting into bad situations. Yeah. So how do you know Dubside? How did you uh, meet Dubside? And um, what was your first impressions of him? So Dubside has always sort of been this mysterious guy to me. Um, When I was learning how to roll, uh, I was always looking videos up online and trying to figure out how to do various different roles. And I remember finding videos of Dubside and just being taken back by by how graceful he was able to do all of these roles. And, and, you know, to me, he was just the pinnacle of this like ninja in the water. You know, he's like, he's wearing black all the time. He's got all this black gear and his, he was just so smooth and one with the water. And I always wanted to meet Dubside. And I remember he was uh, scheduled actually to come up to Pacific Paddling Symposium to teach. And I was super excited. I was, I was going to be co-teaching with him. It was going to be, I was, absolutely stoked and unfortunately Dubside never made it past the border that year and uh, I didn't have an opportunity to teach with him that year but uh, years later uh, when we went down to Delmarva James Roberts uh, and, and Dip Nahanese, uh the three of us we traveled down to Delmarva which is uh, Delaware and that was the first time that I'd actually 
had a chance to meet Dubside. But what a what cool. an awesome what an awesome character! I I really enjoyed his company, a wealth of knowledge, and uh, yeah, him and I just kind of clicked right away. It was like it was like you just met your brother. You know what I mean? And when you're passionate about something, and you share a passion, when you meet somebody like that, it's it's like you have this understanding. And it was kind of like that with Dubside. I remember meeting Dubside, and it was like I'd already known him for years. So that that's how I initially that's how I initially met Dubside. And then later on in, in the years when I when I ended up going to to Greenland, uh, Dubside actually was an honorary judge that year, and he actually judged me in the in the competition. Oh wow! Yeah. Yeah, so that's how I initially, uh, how I initially met him. I think I know the incident you're talking about when he was trying to get into Canada to teach at that symposium. Right. And he couldn't get, uh, they wouldn't let him in because he didn't have a work permit. That's right. Yeah, that's right. That's right. And, and unfortunately, you know, it's a pretty, it's, it's a gray sort of area. Should you be, you know, is it okay if you, if you live in the U.S., if you come to Canada and work at a symposium? If it's considered work, then generally they'll turn you back. I think that the same would apply if I come down to the U.S. It's okay to go to these symposiums and teach at the symposiums. It's just as soon as you start to make a profit from it or you're you're being given a wage that it becomes generally an issue. So. He said that he, I, I guess he just turned around, uh, you know, he got off the ferry terminal and turned around and went back. Yeah. Yeah. There, there's not a whole lot more you can do, right? Unfortunately, it's kind of a gray area, and let's hope in the future that that they look at that because the reality is is often when we're bringing people in from other countries to to symposiums in Canada, they, it's a specialty thing, right? It's the uh, it's something that they do that perhaps others around the world aren't necessarily doing. So it's a very specialty type of thing generally when you're pulling in international instructors into into symposiums. So hopefully in the future they'll look at that. This isn't the first time that I've heard of issues of, of uh, you know, instructors trying to travel around the world and go to symposiums. It, it happens more often than we want to know. Hmm. So ho- hopefully one day that gets sorted out. Were you a member of Kayak USA before you went to Delmarva? I became a, a member of Kayak USA once I arrived to Delmar- Delmarva. That was my initial, my initiation right there into Kayak USA was was going down to Delmarva and participating in that first uh, event. That's when I became a member. So how did the idea of competing in the Greenland National Kayaking Championships come up? Well, you know, through my journey, I, I never really had the desire to compete. Although I am pretty competitive by nature, it never really it never really crossed my mind to do that. For, for me, rolling was more of a meditative a meditative thing, uh, working through some fear. And, and, uh, it wasn't until, you know, we actually were going down to Delmarva and I was with James and Dipna and the idea just kind of came, Hey, you know, we, we should be going to Greenland. You know, this is a pilgrimage for, for us. You know, we've come, we've done this journey all this way, you know, Greenland just really feels like the next sort of step. And I remember going to Delmarva and meeting Dubside and Helen Wilson and, and a bunch of other great folks there at Kayak USA. And we were being encouraged by a lot of these people. Yeah, you guys really should go to Greenland. You know, you'll have a lot of fun. You'll learn a lot. You know, you, you guys are both pretty good at rolling. So you probably do fairly well. You know, you'll it'll be a great experience. So we were being encouraged by Dubside and, and Helen and, you know, and I remember going in the pool and, and them helping us with some of the roles, just primarily with the rules uh, of, mm. of some of the roles. Um, you know, for example, side skull, if, you, if your kayak isn't, you know, straight up and down, for example, you're not getting points. So having some of these little tips and little pieces of information were, were super valuable before going into the competition. Because I, as I've heard from uh, competitors before that have gone to, to, to Greenland is sometimes you go there thinking you know the role and then you go to take the role and they and they ask if you want to do it if you want to try again and you're what, what do you mean what do you mean try again you know I just I just did the role however it's not quite exactly to the spec that they're looking for so having some of those tips from Helen and from Dubside that was huge that was that was huge information so that was 
that was great. But that's how it initially sort of came to be. It was just a conversation James and I and Dipna had in a car driving down to Del Marva, and we just decided we're doing it. We're going to go to Greenland, and wow. quickly it became Greenland bound. You know, and that that was it. On the way home, we were like, "Well, how are we going to pull this off?" You know, because this is going to cost us a lot of money, and and so we decided what we would do is while we were there, uh, we were going to create a documentary, and, and doing that, we we decided we would crowdfund to see if we could get ourselves actually to Greenland, and our give back would be this documentary that we could create to help spread some of this information about about the games because there really wasn't a lot of information online about it and still to this day it's, it's difficult to find very good information um, about that i know dubside's done a number of stuff which is is probably the most informative information you can find really online about about the championship so um yeah that that's sort of how that all came to be how did david hartman get involved as uh, uh being the director in and uh, editing the film. James and I, when we were in Greenland, we were filming primarily, doing a lot of filming while we were there. Um, uh, both of us with cameras running around constantly. And if James was competing, I would have a camera and vice versa. Uh, and the intent was for me to actually do the editing of, of that film. However, I found it quite overwhelming. Um, and Editing documentaries, as, as you, you would know, is a lot of work. And it was a oh, lot yeah. more work, I think, than I had realized. And I started going through all of the footage and, and you know, putting it all together and realizing, man, this is, I think I've, I think I've swallowed something too big here. I don't think I can actually, this is of my ability. So that's when we decided to reach out to uh, David Hartman. It was a friend of uh, James and Dipna's. And he did an absolutely excellent job, really. He took that, that footage, and um, he really did a great job with it. So in the end, it was a good decision, I think, going that, that route, for sure. But that's how David got involved in the project. I, uh, I know exactly what you're talking about <laughs> on uh, right. starting a project and uh, realizing, oh, you know, maybe this is a lot this is too big for my skills. And, um, yeah, that's great. That you're and it was hard. It, it was hard, hard for me to admit that too. You know what I mean? You know, like going through it and trying to put it all together. I really, I had the desire and the want to be able to put it together. I just didn't necessarily have the full skill set to do it. And it was hard for me to let that go and, and to say, okay, I need, I need to take my hands away from this and just let somebody that's a professional, you know, take the reins here. Yeah. And he did a great job. And, uh, for our listeners, Greenland Bound, A Paddler's Pilgrimage, is available on YouTube, and I'll put a link in the show notes. Let's back up a little bit. How did you first get involved in Greenland style? When did you first uh, uh, pick up a Greenland paddle and, and really start to, to use it? Well, it was, it was actually after I had learned to roll. Um, initially, I had learned to roll with a Euroblade, and... I actually had a shoulder injury. Uh, I had a neighbor of mine uh, who is big into, into kayaking. His name is Roy Stolle. And he quickly became my, uh, a really, really close friend of mine. And one evening, I think it must have been around 1130 or something like this, he gives me a call. Let's go midnight surfing. And, you know, I just learned how to roll. And, and this sounded exciting to me. So we went out that night, and I remember uh, that evening getting thrown over unexpectedly and rolling. And I'd done quite a bit of damage to my shoulder and mm -hmm. dislocated part of it and really had a, a hard time even getting myself back into the kayak. It was so bad. Um, and you know, at this point, um, you know, for me, uh, kayaking really started as, as a fear of the water. And now I had just learned how to roll and I had, I had really started to, get out into bigger water and now all of a sudden my shoulder you know is out so now I'm sitting on the couch for months wow. and uh and I remember looking at a paper and there was this fellow that was paddling around Vancouver Island uh for the record and I thought wow how ambitious that's a that's a pretty long paddle you know we're talking I, I think he ended up beating that record in 12 days or something like that oh, which wow. is crazy crazy amount of uh time 
And I, I remember watching him and he had this spot. So I'd go online and I'd watch his spot. And every day I'd sort of follow and see where he was going. I'm like, man, this guy's actually going to beat the record. This is great. And he was finishing in Nanaimo. And Roy and I decided what we would do. And we were going to go out and meet, and meet Joel Blennis because he, he was just this inspiration to us. We wanted to meet this guy. Hmm. And so we paddled out a couple points before where he was actually finishing. And we sat there and we waited, waited for Joe to come along. And we, I, we must have been there a few hours for sure, sitting there waiting. And all of a sudden, he comes paddling around the corner. And I remember seeing him. And all I see is this little stick kind of coming up. Right. And I'm like, no way. This can't be the guy that's beating the record. That's not possible. And he starts getting closer. I'm like, man, it looks like he's got this little twig in his hand. Like that doesn't even look like a paddle. And he paddles up to us. He was kind enough to have a conversation with us. And I asked him about the paddle. He's like, oh, this is a Greenland paddle. You just have to, it just has to be a little bit deeper. And I got the same purchase out of it. And he was all stoked about this paddle, you know, talked to us for a little bit and said, look guys, you know, I'm, I'm in the middle of, of this race right now. I'll get to the finish line. How about you guys paddle over there and we'll chat afterwards. And so I remember him taking off with this Greenland paddle and I had a Euro blade and I tried to, tried to keep up with him and there was no way I was doing it. He was absolutely flying with this thing. And we ended up paddling over to where the finish line was. And there was all these people. There must've been uh, between, I would say 70 to a hundred people just sort of gathered around. The news was there with cameras. I remember when we showed up, they were breaking a bottle of champagne or beer or whatever it was over the kayak. And, and uh, it was this big sort of event going on. And, I started sort of paddling away and, and Joe yells out my name and says, James, come on back. And he ended up inviting me at, to go over to Newcastle Island, which was right across from where he had finished. Um, he was going to go spend the night there. And so he invited me to go over to the island. And so at that time I was self-employed and I figured, man, I'm not going to let go of this opportunity. So I quickly figured out how to get myself a tent and a sleeping bag and all the things I needed. And I went over to the island. And I spent some time meeting my new friend, you know. And uh, while we were there, I'm standing on the shoreline, sort of checking out his kayak. And here comes this paddler into the beach. And uh, she was she had this black kayak, just this ninja-looking slick kayak. And I and it was a happened to be a Taihe Greenland. And she was wearing a tulip, which, uh, like we all know, is an upper body garment. It was black. And she had this little Greenland paddle, another person with this Greenland paddle. And she paddles into the beach. And I remember just being in awe. I was like, man, she just looks like this little ninja on the water. And paddles into the beach. And I quickly go over to her. And I say, what kind of kayak is this? Wow, this thing looks crazy. This looks like a Ferrari. And she says, oh, well, this is a rolling kayak. And I said, oh, that's great. I just learned how to do a kayak roll. And, and she says, oh, that, that's awesome. What kayak roll did you learn? And I said, well, you know, the one where you go upside down and, and you flip back up. <laughs> <laughs> I, did, I didn't realize there was more than one. I thought there was just a sea kayak roll. And she says to me, she's like, oh, well, that's not even one of the 35 Greenland rolls. And the moment she said this, I had absolutely, I was boggled. I was like, oh, my God, there's 35 different ways to roll a kayak. That lady happened to be Helen Wilson. So <laughs> she she ended up telling me there was these thirty five different ways to roll, and I was I was blown away. I could not believe there were thirty five different ways to roll a kayak. After that happened, Joe ended up giving me his spare paddle from that trip. I went home, and at that time, I was really into motocross and dirt biking and that sort of stuff. And about a month prior to this, uh, I had had. Uh, a buddy of mine got in an accident and actually busted his femur and it was a really, really bad accident. Hmm. And so I decided that motocross maybe wasn't for my future. <laughs> you know, <laughs> like I was, I was going to break myself next. Uh, and so this is w one of the reasons why I had sort of taken on kayaking. And um, so when I went home, I quickly sold that dirt bike that I had. And I remember finding that exact same Taihe Greenland that Helen had, and it was local to Victoria, believe it or not. Some guy just had it in his garage, tucked up in the rafters, had it there for years, and it was still brand new. 
and I managed to find one. And I remember going to buy that kayak and that was it. I was hooked. Nice. I went out literally, it literally every single day and obsessively started working on these, these 35 different roles. Nice. Yeah. So that's how I initially sort of discovered Greenland, Greenland style kayaking. It was really, it was Joe Blennis that was paddling around the island and then being inspired by Helen Wilson uh, when she told me there was 35 different ways to roll. I had no idea. You know, it wasn't until after that trip I went home and started to research it. I was like, holy smokes. And I'm watching some of these rolls just being blown away. Like people rolling with rocks and all these sorts of things. I just, I didn't even know it was possible. So this all started really with a fear of the water for me. So when I was a young boy, about 14 years old, I was actually attacked by a loon in a lake. Um, my father and I uh, went fly fishing often, and uh, we would use what's called a belly boat. And a belly boat is sort of an inner tube you sit in, and you wear you have this pair of waders on and a pair of fins. You have a fly rod, and when you're fishing, you're you're kicking backwards, so you're going very slow, but you're sort of surface level to the water, so you can fish. And um, a particular lake where where we would always go called Pass Lake. Uh, there's a little bit of a, an island, a, a spot where loons actually nest. And I had actually ended up kicking backwards into this area. And of course, the mother or the father or whoever it was came down at me and started swatting at me. And, you know, I quickly used my fly rod to defend myself. And I was dominating that. And, and next thing you know, the, the bird goes underneath the water. And let me tell you, Andrew, it was the scariest moment of my life. <laughs> You ever have those dream? You ever have those dreams where you're trying to run but you just can't run? It, it was sort of like that. It was like I was the spaceman, and I'm trying to defend myself from something that is just jetting around, and it started pecking at my waders, and it really wanted wow. me out of this area. So I ended up kicking out of that area. Luckily, unscathed, a few bruises on my legs, and uh, bushwhacked back to my father's truck, and that was it. I refused to get back into the water. Um, I never went back into water until, you know, it was years and years and years. Water was just not my thing. Um, I was absolutely terrified by it. Um, and then uh, how I actually got into kayaking itself was I was a web developer at the time, and I built actually a website um, for a kayak company. And long story short, uh, they weren't able to pay that invoice, so I ended up getting a kayak in return because it made more financial sense to the business for them to give me a kayak rather than pay for the invoice. So I ended up with this kayak and really that kayak to me was just an asset. It wasn't necessarily something that um, I planned on using. I mean, I'm afraid of the water. Why would I want a kayak? <laughs> right. Was it, was this like a uh, nice, this is a nice, uh, you know, expedition style sea kayak. Yeah, it was. It was. A, it was basically a tour kayak, right? Uh -huh. and, and it was brand, is brand spanking new. Wow. Uh, in plastic, in plastic, and I had this thing for months. And it wasn't really until that accident had happened with my buddy that I had decided, you know, I think I need to do something different. And living in Victoria, I had seen kayakers out on the water, but I'd never really seen any of an extreme side to it. I didn't know there was such thing as you know, the hurricane riders and, and riding tidal rapids and surfing these things. Heck, I didn't even know you could roll a sea kayak at the time. Um, I just thought this was, you know, older people like to float around in the water. <laughs> and, and and so really, once, once uh, this accident, motocross accident happened, I decided I would take the kayak out and just sort of give it a shot. And I remember taking it out for the first time, and I got out maybe about 20 meters from the shoreline, and I had an absolute panic attack. And I didn't know anything about a kayak. I mean, I didn't have a spray deck on. Luckily, I had a PFD on. I was smart enough to do that. Uh, but I didn't know there was foot pegs in this thing. I didn't know what thigh braces were. I'm just sitting in this thing flopping around. And, man, let me tell you, if there's loons in a lake, what's in an ocean? You know, my mind is, tri my mind is tripping. And I just do not want to swim. So I remember paddling back you know, just freaking out, and, and I put this thing back on the truck and ended up putting it up for sale. And long story short, this guy ended up coming, looking at it, and said, and said man, why are you selling this? And, and, and I told him, and he said, well, why don't you just learn how to roll? 
And so that's really where, where that came from. Um, the guy that actually told me this, he, he said to me, he said, look, I'm happy to teach you how to roll. Uh, and so we ended up going to the lake the first time. And I remember that just being absolutely terrifying for me because huh. we know where, we know where loons like to hang out in the lake. Right. <laughs> so here I am in a lake trying to learn how to roll. And that's the only thing that's in my mind. And I remember him telling me all this information you need to do this. You're going to do this and this and this and all these things. And none of it was retaining in my brain. I was literally just thinking about a learn and I, I go underneath the water and just panic just instantly kicks in. And it was a real struggle for me. Uh, and, and we ended up having another session after that where he decided, because at this point I decided I would tell him about my loon story. And he said, well, James, maybe you should have told me about that before I brought you to the lake. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and so he ended up taking me to the pool and having a few sessions with me in a pool. And that's, and that's where I initially learned how to do a roll. And that roll was more of a sweet style C to C kind of roll. So that's really how I got into kayaking. And then from that point, that's when I ended up with an injury later on down the road and, and moving into meeting Joe Blennis, Helen Wilson, and being inspired with the Greenman style. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah. yeah. Wasn't that kayak of hers uh, stolen later on? She I don't know if it was that exact. If it was that exact one, but it very well could have been. It very well could have been. I know. I know she had a couple of them stolen uh, up near the border when they were up in Canada. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that that was pretty unfortunate. I don't know if those kayaks ever were recovered, but they're pretty unique looking kayaks for somebody to steal. Yeah. So it kind of a, is a bit of a surprise to steal something like that. Um, yeah, I don't know if those were ever recovered. I can understand how, um, that experience and that fear of the water can, uh, influence your teaching style. Oh, for sure. For sure. I mean, everybody probably has some, you know, fear regarding sea kayaking. Right. For me, it was always surf. Okay. I think my first, uh, experience in surf, even though I had a solid role and never came out of my boat. Just the feeling of being out of control and uh, just the power of these waves, you know, throwing you toward shore. Uh, and it took me a while to really kind of get over that. How do you deal with that kind of fear in people when trying to teach them how to roll? What, what's your approach to that? So I, I believe it's really in a gentle approach. It, it has a lot to do with how you're speaking to the student, your, your demeanor. Um, if you're really excited and almost militant, it almost puts them in a, in a deeper state of fear. I, I, I believe that a lot of students coming to a rolling clinic um, are dealing with some kind of fear, regardless if they know they are or not. Uh, there's really nothing natural about being upside down in a kayak. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, I believe that it's the gentle approach that really, really can help with that. Another thing that I do when I'm teaching is I, I teach backwards. And, and I know there's a lot of uh, instructors out there that do this and I believe strongly in, in that approach and really by doing that you can really instill confidence in that student as they're going through the process before putting their face into the water um, as soon as the face goes into the water all that information that you told that student generally just floats right out of their ears it's gone you know they're in that state of fear uh, panic will start to set in and all the information is gone they just don't know what to do so I believe going through that process really slowly and the face going in the water is really the last piece that you want to be working on. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the other thing that I do as well is when I teach a clinic, the first half of that clinic I spend on land and I really break down the physics of how to roll a kayak. Uh, if you truly understand what you're supposed to be doing and how the physics work, and the body position and the movement and what you're supposed to be doing with your legs, you know, and that it's not really that you're not really reliant on the paddle. It's all about these, uh, all about body positioning and flotation. Uh, when you can really break down that theory for people and give them that sort of physics lesson, it really helps with the learning process. Um, and, and I think that also helps people uh, with that fear, just having a little bit more understanding of what they are doing before they actually get into the water and put their face underneath the water. So a lot of that, it will come from, you know, my fear initially. I'm just very, very sensitive to people 
uh, that have that fear. And it's that gentle approach, you know, the power of touch, you know, just a slight touch on the back of the head, everything's going to be okay. Uh, it, people are very sensitive to that sort of, that sort of stuff. So I have had a lot of students that, that have had anxiety issues and uh, a lot of fear and they'll come to me specifically to work with that because they know that that's the place where I started. So I, I have sort of a soft spot for those type of people. And, and a lot of it's patience. A lot of it is patience. It's little baby steps to get you to where you want to go. I remember one clinic that I had with this lady and, um, you know, I remember putting her in the kayak and going into the water and that was it. She was just terrified right at that moment. We hadn't even gone two feet in the water and she was terrified. And, and I said, okay, we need to start by you being out of the kayak. So we took that part away and just walked into the water and just focused on dipping our faces in the water and then going from that to laying on her back to slowly dipping our face in the water. And it was this progression that was happening. And by doing it slowly and, and she started to gain more and more and more confidence. And by the time we got into the kayak, that fear was sort of eliminated. And I ended up having to do quite a few sessions with her because her anxiety was pretty strong. Uh, but now she is arguably, arguably one of the gracefulest Greenland kayak rollers in her area. Wow. And it's abso absolutely amazing to see the transformation of her being terrified to even get into the water and put her face in the water to being this graceful Greenland roller and now using Greenland rolling as her therapy, if you will, just like I did when I went through that process, you know, learning those roles was my therapy. I was, I was able to get out. And even if I had a really bad day, I could go out and roll and all, all of that would sort of wash away, you know, because my focus and my mindset was on what I was doing. And, and it just put me in this state of calmness. And I was able to share that with her and, and she was able to go down that journey as well. So I think that's uh, that's a powerful thing to be able to help somebody with fear. And I think it has a lot to do with approach and just a nice soft approach, realizing that some people it's going to take them a long time to get there. Sometimes some people they're going to they're going to pick up the skills and boom, they're going to have it. In fact, I, I've had students where I've done the land demonstration and I say, OK, I'm going to go put on my dry suit. I'll meet you guys in the water. And I turn around and they're out there rolling their kayak and they didn't even didn't even have an instructor standing beside them. They just needed the information. Hmm. So some people can take it to that level. Others, it's it's a journey, you know. So I enjoy working with those people, and I enjoy helping them come, you know, break through that fear. That's really impressive. I must it must be incredibly satisfying to uh, be able to teach someone who is that anxious and, yeah. and to have them, uh, you know, become such an accomplished roller. Yeah, and I think a lot of it, it comes from having those similar experiences myself and being able to share that with that individual. You know, as soon as you share it, you, you say, look, I, I, I can truly sympathize with how you're feeling right now. I've been here and I understand it. And this is what worked for me when I, when I was in that situation. You know, and I, and I think being able to do that can really help a person that's going through that like having somebody there that gets it that actually understands because that i mean there are there are instructors that will get a little bit frustrated with people that have that anxiety and try to push them through right and it only it only amplifies that and makes it worse for those particular individuals so i, I think it's just approach it's 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 really each individual is different you know so it, it's sort of determining that individual and, and what their needs are and, and where they're getting stuck and, and how you can help them break through that, that small moment and then get to the next spot where they get stuck and then help them break through that moment. Hmm. Right. And it's a progressional, it's a progressional thing, just like as we learn to roll and we learn to roll the more and more and more difficult roles, we get stuck, right. We get to a point where we can't progress any further and we have to regret or we have to go back to the beginning and look at the physics and really understand what we're doing and climb back up that ladder again. So. Yeah, it's going to be a long process in learning some of these roles. And, uh, you know, you learn a role and then you lose it and then you learn it again. Right. So you and James Roberts built your own kayaks. What was it like building kayaks with uh, Turner Wilson? So I didn't actually build the kayaks uh, with them. It was James and Dipna that went down 
and built them with Sherry and Turner. Okay. Um, at that at that time, I was working and I had some other obligations and I wasn't able to get down uh, to do that. However, while they were down there building them, um, I did spend some time on Skype sort of back and forth because Turner put uh, all the work into my particular kayak and he needed specific information, body sizes and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, well, I did spend the time going back and forth to, to get the specs, but hands down to Turner because he's the one that actually built my particular kayak. James was able to get down there and build his own kayak. Uh, and then what they did was they put them, they built a, a nice little crate that they, they stowed them in and then they ended up going onto a ship and then being shipped off to Greenland. Okay. When you looked at the, the Greenlanders kayaks and compare them to your kayaks, did you notice any differences or, uh, Oh, certainly, Cer certainly. I, I, I remember going there and pulling them out of the container and putting them down, um, uh, um, near the comp comp competition area there and and uh, a bunch of Greenlanders just kind of hovering around our kayaks and just being looking at them like wow you know because they're they're quite meticulously built and we have a lot of attention to detail uh, we've got good materials that we can work with and you know Turner Wilson uh, you you must have seen his kayaks at some point mm -hmm. down the line and they're just absolutely pieces of art you know like they're very, very, very well built. Um, they're meticulously built. A and the Greenlanders, I remember looking at them, and the first thing they do is they put their head into the cockpit and they look at the framework and ad and they were just admiring it, just being like, wow, this is like a very, very well built kayak. And when we would look around at some of the other competitors' kayaks, I remember looking at some, I remember looking in one and seeing like a kitchen utensil as a rib, you know, like they, they're basically using whatever they can to, to, to build these kayaks. They don't have the same resources we do. You know, I think now they, they may have more resources than they, than they had in the past. In the past, these were all built with driftwood. Uh, but now you're seeing them build even, even pallets, like they're taking pallets, scarfing them together and building kayaks. Like, they're, they're using pieces of wood. They're using whatever they can in order to make these kayaks. So uh, to them, it's not so much about this like perfect build as it is something that is useful and actual practical that they can actually get out on the water. If that means grabbing something, a kitchen utensil, if you will, to make shift the, make shift the rib, then that's what you're going to do. So yeah, the, there, there is definitely a difference. There was definitely a difference between what we brought and what they had that, that they were making uh not to say that it was a huge difference i mean it was the same design it's just you saw the difference really in materials is where you saw the difference so what was your first impression of the greenlanders i'd met uh greenlanders when i'd been to japan before so i'd met some members of kwana katopia when when i was there and had become pretty good friends with them over the the time i was there and so when i had went to greenland uh initially i i knew a few people there uh which was kind of nice um but the initial the initial um experience was good i mean i mean i think maybe in the beginning there was a little bit of a standoffishness to it because when james and i went there we really went to to film a lot and so as you can imagine if a couple foreigners come into your country and they're just running around with cameras trying to film everything you're doing it's a little bit intimidating, I think. Mm -hmm. And, and until they realized why we were there, I think there was a little bit of a standoffish sort of bit going on. But, but once they'd realized, Oh, we're, we're actually here to, to share this information and we're also here to compete. Then things started to turn around and we started to, to become friends with, with everybody. And, and it became a much better environment. And incidentally, it was the kids really that warmed up to us first. Like we're running around with cameras. Well, kids are just curious, right? So they're hanging off of us. They want to use our camera. You know, they, they want to film with us. And, and, you know, we were getting along with the kids really great, kind of throwing them in the air and just having a good time and, and dancing around with them. And I think once the adults sort of saw, okay, these are, these guys aren't just here to film and, and take away from us, you know, they're, they're here to actually be a part of this event and, and things started to warm up a lot at that point. That must have been an incredible challenge to both, compete and try to film yourselves 
competing. Absolutely. And I, and I think now looking back at that experience, I, I think it took away a little bit, you know, from yeah. doing that. When, as you know, as a filmmaker, even as a hobbyist, like when you're, when you're filming, you're in that moment, you're, you're behind that lens and you're trying to capture all of those, all of those moments. And when you're capturing those moments, you can't be in those moments. And, and I think that becomes a challenging thing. And, and I think as a result of that, I think that, that, you know, James and I lost out a little bit on that experience just because our focus was very strongly on trying to get that content because that was our give back to the community for getting us there. So we didn't want to let the community down. Um, it would have been very nice just to put that camera down and just go be a part of the event for the most part of it. Mm -hmm. We were able to do that for it. We were able to do that, uh, but not necessarily as much as, as I think I would have liked to. If, if I like, if I was to go back to Greenland again, which I do plan on doing at some point, I I'll keep the camera at home. I'm, I'm going to go there and just experience the culture, be a part of it and not focus so much on trying to capture the content. So you're right. You're right. Being being a film a videographer while you're there and trying to compete at the same time, a challenge. Definitely a challenge. Well, you pulled it off and it turned out great. Um, so for anybody who wants to see that, be sure to check it out. Greenland Bound of Paddler's Pilgrimage. All right. Excellent. Thank you so much. So Dubside was telling me that you've spent a lot of time in Japan because they have a. Uh, uh, Greenland style kayak club over there. Yeah. Yeah. So Japan happened to actually be the very first place that I got invited to, to teach. Um, of course I had taught a couple people in my local area, uh, how to roll. Uh, but very quickly after that, uh, a fellow named Ichi Ito, uh, from, from Japan contacted me and asked me to attend guts which is uh, a traditional event that they have there in Japan. So I was honored to actually be able to go uh, to Japan and teach. And what an experience. Oh, man, I, that was probably one of, that's probably been one of the highlights of my career doing this uh, is going to Japan. Um, it's just a very unique culture, uh, and they're really, really into it. I mean, just like a lot of things uh, with the Japanese, when they get into something, they get really, really good at it. Hmm. And and when it comes to kayak building, man, you want to talk about meticulously built kayaks? Some, some of the kayaks that I saw there in Japan were just jaw-dropping. You would look at them and be like, wow, the attention to detail is meticulously done. It's so well done. Um, and an interesting thing, before I went to Japan, I had actually decided I was going to start a little bit of a business uh, teaching rolling. And so I started a, 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 a brand name called Roll, Roll, Roll Your Boat. Hmm. And uh, when I went to Japan, I remember there was four other members of Kwanak Utopia that were going to be attending this event and uh, right directly from Greenland. And that was really intimidating for me. I mean, this is the first event that I'm teaching at. I've got to now go to this event and teach with Greenlanders you know, it was really intimidating. And I remember when I showed up at this event, there's like all of our mug shots kind of up on the wall. Like there's all the Greenlanders and then there's James Mankey. Roll, roll, roll your boat. <laughs> and they roll in. And I remember, I, I think it was John Peterson uh, that, that looked at my mug shot and he read, roll, roll, roll your boat. And I just saw him shaking his head like, who is this guy? <laughs> right. And he comes and gets me and he takes me outside. And I quickly was told that it is not a boat. It is a kayak. <laughs> oh yeah. And that I shouldn't, I should not be calling it a boat. So that the name of, of my business was slightly offensive to the Greenlanders. Wow. And that if I was going to be an ambassador and teaching this stuff around the world, that it would be, the respectful thing to do to, to change that name. And so that's what I did when I came home. I changed that from roll, roll, roll your boat to all things kayak felt the traditional way. And that was from that experience learning that uh, I was told, I was told uh, that a kayak is something that you're connected to. Um, and it becomes a part of your body or, or an extension of your legs. You become amphibious with the water and, and you're connected. You're as one. 
and a boat is simply something you sit in and you don't necessarily have control. Um, and you know, like boats and outboard engines and rifles and all this modern day technology came into Greenland at a later date. And that became the preferred method of hunting, which almost took out the existence of the kayak. So that it makes a lot of sense to me after hearing that story, why they wouldn't want a kayak being called a boat. So it's a, it's a pretty sensitive topic to them. In fact, at some uh, traditional events, Delmarva is one of them. If you go to, if you actually call a kayak a boat, you have to put a dollar in the jar. <laughs> that, that jar gets pretty full of money by the end of the event because, as you can imagine, in North America, we're boat, 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 boat. Everything's a boat, right? Yeah. In fact, I still do on occasion call it a boat. But trust me, if I'm going back to Greenland or if I'm in the presence of a Greenlander or I'm Speaking of something traditional, I do refer to it as a kayak because I believe it is a kayak. It is not a boat. Um, at that event, when we were there, uh, I was having we were having dinner, and and this is after I had been lectured uh, by John. And um, <laughs> I remember saying the word boat and being like, "Oh shoot! I hope nobody heard that." And I get a tap on the shoulder, and it's one of the Greenlanders, and, and they. Uh, sort of give me the, the the signal, come outside, right? And, and there was no English being spoken at all at this point. It was just come outside with me. And I, I remember thinking, uh-oh, now I'm going to get myself beat up for saying the <laughs> word. <laughs> and, and I go out, we go outside, and he starts walking down the path, and he keeps motioning me to come with him. And I'm like, oh, man, he wants to take me away from the building to beat me up, right? <laughs> and he keeps taking me for this little walk, and we go down near, near the water, and he walks up beside me, puts his arm around me, and I, I'm flinching a little bit at this point, of course. And he points out at the water, and he points to a boat, and he says, James, boat. And that will never leave me. I will never forget that moment. He made a point of leaving his dinner to take me out to the shore to explain to me what a boat was. Wow. <laughs> yes. So that was one of that. That happened in Japan, and that was the very first event that I had gone to. And uh, one of the other uh, things that had happened at this event was um, they have, uh, they're, they're really, really good at rolling a lot of these guys. And they have this little uh, uh, sort of group and they were called the Mau Wow Rangers. And what they would do is they would do demonstrations for the crowd. So they have two speakers on the beach sort of facing toward the crowd. Um, and then you would have these five guys, uh, and one of them was a female and the four guys, and they were out on the water in these, in these uh, Greenland kayaks, but they would wear masks. So they had like a, a mask on each of them and each was a different color. And they go out and they roll in sync to this, like this uh, music that they would play. And the music kind of rem- reminded me sort of of like a uh, Mau Wow Ranger type of, or, I, I don't know, like it was this kind of music would go along with it and they were doing these roles and everybody's all excited on the shoreline taking photos. And I remember seeing this just being like, man, these guys are right into this stuff. Like I thought I was into this. These, these guys are right into it. And I'm watching from the shore and they stop it right in the middle of the demonstration and they paddle up to the shore and they point at me and they bring me over to the shore and they, all stand up and they pull out a black mask and they hand it to me and they announce me the new Mawal Ranger, uh, <laughs> uh, black Mawal Ranger is, is who I was. So uh, now I had to go out with this group. I didn't even know this was coming. I had to go out with this group and now do these roles and think. And my initiation to that, they wanted me to come up with one unique role uh, that they weren't doing. And so I decided that role would be uh, the beer role. <laughs> <laughs> so well i asked i'd asked somebody in the crowd to hand me a beer so i was handed over a Sapporo beer i remember the specific beer and uh i took it out and it wasn't open and as i roll upside down you've probably seen dubsite actually do this roll uh quite a few times online you see it's like the candle roll they yes, call it the so candle it gets, you exactly yeah so you hold the candle and you can't let the candle get wet so you have to pass it around the hall of the kayak so what I did was I took this beer and I passed it over the hall of the kayak to my other hand and then did a forward finish roll 
to finish it, crack the beer. And as I sat up, I chugged the beer. Nice. <laughs> so I, I called that the great Canadian beer roll and they just all loved it. They thought that was great. So yeah, that was a really, really fun experience. But uh, yeah, if, if you ever have a chance to go to Japan, uh, go check it out, uh, get in touch with Ichi Ito and check out the, check out the Greenland kayaks and, and the club that they have there. Absolutely awesome. A great, great bunch of people. And if you thought you were into something, you probably aren't near as into it as they are because they are absolutely into this stuff. Greenland ropes, all of it. It was, it was an amazing experience. Wow. That's I said that there's a lot of drinking going on among the Japanese in those events. Oh yes, and, and uh, that you were you, you were probably one of the only foreigners who can uh, hold his own against them. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe not now. Maybe not <laughs> now that I'm a little older. I don't know I could hold up with that. But uh, yeah, I, I remember that. That's definitely. I, I think with the Japanese culture, it's a lot about work, 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 work. And when it's time to play, they play hard. So, you know, when it was the evening time came around, there was definitely a lot of a lot of alcohol being consumed. Um, and, yeah, they would definitely challenge me. Uh, and I think the thing is there, they're, they're trying to find out who passes out first, because <laughs> if you pass out, what what they do is they actually start pulling out the jiffy markers once once people start passing out. So if you pass out and you then the jiffy markers come out and they start drawing all over your stomach and all over your face and <laughs> and it's just this hilarious hilarious thing. So you know if you're the last man standing, you you don't have the jiffy markers sort of on your face. You know what I mean? <laughs> so <laughs> if if you go to Japan and you go to one of these these events, my suggestion is to sleep with one eye open. <laughs> <laughs> Either that or be really good at drinking so so you're not the last man standing. <laughs> but yeah, definitely definitely waking up a little bit hungover at uh, some of those days for sure, as were the rest of them. <laughs> wow. Sounds like a blast. Yeah. Oh, an absolute blast. A, a whole lot of fun. You know, I got taken all around Japan after the event too and, and was, you know, chaperoned really, if you will, by, by, by a fellow. And it was, it's just an amazing experience. Like the Japanese culture is just enthralling to me. It's like the, like the Greenland uh, uh, culture, same thing, just really interesting, interesting cultures. So I'm, I'm all about that. It was a great time. And I've been lucky enough now to go back to Japan a few more times to those events. So oh. uh, I've, I've made some good friends there. And uh, you know, when this pandemic is all over, I hope to one day go back and, and visit them all again. You know, it's definitely a highlight for me as Japan is a, is a big one on that list. Very good. Well, one last question. So how can people find you on the Internet? So to find me online, you can go to kayak.ca, and that's spelled traditionally. So Q-A-J-A-Q dot C-A. And on there, I have a bunch of courses that uh, I will be running in the local area through this summer. Uh, and then the other really good way to find out where I'm at and what I'm doing and what's new uh, is through Facebook. That's really the best way to, to find out what's going on with me. Um, I am pretty active on Facebook. So if you go online, just type in James Mankey. And if you see a guy pointing at the camera, uh, that's, that's likely going to be me. <laughs> All right, James, thanks so much for being on the show. And uh, we'll have to keep in touch. Absolutely, man. Thank you so much for, for the call and uh, thanks to both you and Dubside for having me. This has uh, been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so, so much. Thanks everybody for tuning in. If you enjoyed this podcast, let us know what you think and drop us an email at dubcastwithdubside at gmail.com. And remember to please share, comment, like, and subscribe. Also, consider helping support the Dubcast through Patreon. You can also donate directly using PayPal to our email address, dubcastwithdubside at gmail.com.